Welcome to the MOOCs course in Organic Chemical Technology. The title of today's lecture is Introduction and Unit Processes. In the introduction what we are going to see today, we are going to see a few statistics of Indian chemical industry and then we will be seeing the picture of raw materials that means availability of raw materials and then picture of energy etc in uh, India for Indian chemical industry because for any uh, chemical production these two things are very essential raw materials and then energy requirements has to be fulfilled without any hurdle. So, that is the reason in addition to the statistics we are also going to see a few basics or the availability of raw materials and then energy sources etc for chemical industries that is what we are going to see. Then we will see a few basics of unit processes followed by unit operations. Indian chemical industry. Indian chemical industry is very huge. It stands sixth worldwide and third in Asia. Such a huge industry is Indian chemical industry. It contributes 7 percent of India's gross domestic uh, product that is GDP. 7 percent is a huge value. 7 percent contribution to India's GDP is really a kind of huge value. So, uh, that gives a picture of how important is Indian chemical industry for the growth of our country India. Share of chemical industry in India's gross industrial output has increased from 8 percent in 1971 to 45 percent in 1995 and then it may be even more if you take uh, current years statistics. India has become self-sufficient by early 1990s in production of chemicals such as drugs, dye stuffs, pesticides, paints, etc. Why? Because for example, if you see production of fertilizers in early 1990s was almost 22,300 metric ton per year which has almost doubled to 41,400 metric ton per year by 2016 and 17 according to Fertilizer Association of India. Then consumption of NPK that is nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, these are the components usually present in almost all uh, fertilizers. The consumption of NPK has increased from 12,500 tons per year in early 1990s to 26,000 tons per year by 2016 and 17. So, that shows how much important, how much progress are we making in fertilizer industry. Then consumption of chemical fertilizers has increased by around 16 percent between 2015-16 and 2020-21. Then coming to the raw materials picture for India, we are a country where natural resources are very huge. So, obviously it is expected that uh, our uh, resources, raw material resources are huge. India has a large variety of minerals and it is self-sufficient in over 30 minerals. These 30 minerals again are used to uh, for production of several types of chemicals. So, it is a huge number. These minerals form diversified industries such as iron, steel, ferro alloys, aluminum, cement, etc. India's major mineral assets are coal and iron while mica and manganese are of world importance. If we see a part particularly at a few O's then iron ore reserves of India are estimated to be 5 percent of total world reserves. It ranks third in manganese deposits. It is major world producer of mica. How much major? What is the percentage if you see? 80 percent of the world output is coming from India in production of mica. Okay. However, India is deficient in ore deposits of other non-ferrous minerals except aluminum. Also petroleum is other raw material lacking in adequate quantity in the nation, right? So, that is the reason you know uh, we are not completely uh, self-sufficient in terms of the oil, but in terms of other many chemicals such as uh, drugs, etc., pharmaceuticals, etc., uh, steel industry, iron industry, etc., we are almost all self-sufficient, but when it comes to the oil, we are not self-sufficient because our 
raw materials or resources for raw materials to produce petroleum or oil products are fewer. We are depending on majorly on exports. In terms of value, fuels represent 80 percent of minerals produced, so the such is high value are these fuels. And then in terms of imported value, India imported third highest dollar value worth of crude oil during 2021 and then that is approximately 106.4 billion dollars which is almost like 10.4 percent of total imported crude oil worldwide. Whatever the countries which are not having uh, resources, petroleum resources or crude oil resources in their own countries, they obviously depend on the importing and then many countries does importing of such crude. But we are import, we are third highest importer. We import almost 10.4 percent of total imported crude oil worldwide. What are the uh, countries uh, that are supplying us these crude oils? Primarily Iraq, Saudi Arabia, UAE, USA and Nigeria are the top five suppliers of India's crude oil demand. Of course, we also import from other nations also, but these are the five important or uh, top five uh, suppliers of India's crude oil demand. Right? Thus, because of the limited uh, reserves in India and then huge demand for oil, it is only marginally self-sufficient. It is not completely self-sufficient when it comes to the oil. Because of this region, in India still coal remains the principal fuel for India, which is fifth largest producer in the world. Right. So, now we see what is energy picture for India. India's energy sector is most diversified and 80 percent of its energy needs met through coal, oil and solid biomass. It is third highest electricity producer in the world. In India, power is generated from both uh, fuel and non-fuel fuels or fuel and non-fuel uh, resources by conventional and non-conventional methods. By conventional methods like thermal, nuclear and hydro power plants, we get majority of the power and then through renewable resources also like wind, solar and biomass etc. also we are generating power. Major production of electricity is achieved through coal by thermal power plant which is around 75 percent of the total power generation in India. 75 percent of the total power that is being generated in India that is being generated by coal or combustion of the coal in thermal power plants. Okay. India's most power generation in December 2020 stood at 103.6 billion units according to data released by Central Electricity Authority. Right? So, that much how many 103.66 billion units of power has been generated in December 2020. Now, if you see installed generation capacity fuel wise, fuel wise in the sense fossil fuel versus non fossil fuel versus as an 31 5 2022 according to Central Electricity Authority, what we can understand that total fuel fuels contribution in installed generation capacity is 58.6 percent out of which 50.7 percent is coming from the coal, whereas 6.2 percent is coming from the gases and then remaining are the lignite and diesel. Coming to the non fossil fuels which includes renewable energy resources including hydropower and then nuclear power, it contributes approximately 41.4 percent, 39.7 percent is uh, renewable energy sources including hydropower that is addition of these two numbers, 11.6 percent by hydro and then 28.1 percent by wind, solar and other renewable energy resources. This other reno renewable energy resources if you do compound wise then we have this wind energy 10.1 percent, solar 14.1 percent, uh, BM power cogen 2.5 percent and then waste to energy 0.1 percent, small hydropower 
1.2 percent. When you add this together, then you get this 28.1 percent. So, this 28.1 percent and this 11.6 percent adding together to making to 39.7 percent and the nuclear installed generation capacity is 1.7 percent. So, these two when we add together then it is 41.4 percent. So, total fossil fuel contribution is 58.6 percent, total non fossil fuel contribution is 41.4 percent out of the total installed generation capacity that indicates not only fossil fuel, non fossil fuels also their contribution is also uh, increasing drastically because these numbers are the reset numbers by 31 5 2022. Now, transportation picture for India, transportation is also very essential for any chemical plant because sometimes you need to bring the raw materials from very different location compared to the um, from a location which is far away from the plant and then also some many times in not many times almost always the product that you produce, the chemicals that you produce in chemical plant that has to be dispersed to the various, various locations of the nation or sometimes if you are exporting out of the country also. Then transportation is also very much essential from economics point, economics of the plant point of view. Okay? If you do not have any proper transportation, it may be possible that you are not making enough money out of your plant even though your plant is running very efficiently. So, that is the reason transportation is also essential component as far as concern to the chemical industries. So, what are the uh, normal uh, transportation uh, sources that we have in India? Mostly by rail transport because nowadays these goods rails are being connected from uh, one corner to the almost all corners of the India. Right? So, then road transport is also better. Earlier, couple of decades back it was not that good, but now road transport is also improved uh, drastically. Then water transport, pipelines, pipelines also one uh, source of uh, transportation because you know the oil from uh, oil actually transported from the plant to the different locations of the country through pipes and then these, pri these pipes may be going several hundreds of kilometers and then pipes may be having diameter 50 centimeters, 1 meter or even higher value. Many times you may be reading in news, sometimes these pipelines are being broken and then gas or oil is being leaked. So, so that means transportation of this crude or uh, processed oil may be taking place through the pipelines. So, pipelines is also one of the mode of transportation for the chemicals. Then air transport is also may sometimes used for transportation of some of the products. So, that is about a few statistics about Indian chemical industry and then uh, raw material picture, energy picture and then transportation picture for India especially from chemical industry viewpoint. So, now what we are going to see? We are going to see what is chemical industry, what happens, what it is and then what are the unit operations and unit processes, we have a few basics we are going to see now. Okay? Chemical engineering, in chemical engineering what we learn? We learn how the raw materials are being converted or separated into useful products. It is not essential always to take place a reaction or more reactions to get a product from raw materials. Sometimes like ore beneficiation etc. there, there won't be any reaction. There may be a purification of uh, raw materials and then minerals taking place and then uh, product mineral may be extracted or purified without any reaction. So, it is not necessary that always after a reaction only you get a product, without reaction also you get the products because depending on the nature of the industry that we are having. If you, for you if the purified mineral is a product, so then without any reaction you can get a purified minerals by ore beneficiation processes. right? But however, in majority of the chemical plants what happens? There are a, uh, chemical reactions, one or more chemical reactions in order to get a product and then when you do this there in addition to the product there may be byproducts and then because of uh, not having any reaction 100 percent conversion there may be unreacted chemicals are also there. Okay? So, separation of the products, right? So, useful uh, separation of the useful products is also takes place or you know we learned in chemical engineering discipline. right? So, what does chemical engineers they do? They do develop design and engineer both the complete process and equipment used because process is having several equipment. Soon we are going to see in any flow sheet or any uh, uh, 
uh, process description that we are, are going to discuss any of that you take you can see there are n number of equipment are being used right so there those, those equipment design of those equipment is also essential then selection of raw materials selection of raw materials is also important sometimes only one source of raw material may be there sometimes more than one number of uh, sources of raw materials may be there for a given product uh, uh, for a required product generation or production of any, any chemical then selection is also important both from the economics point of view as well as the safety point of view etc also and then as well as the time point of view also sometimes what happens the raw materials may be available cheaply from a far away distance compared to the uh, nearby distance but you know the time lapse may not be useful that may cause a kind of loss to the uh, plant so such kind of parameters may be there in selection of raw materials as well then operate plants with safety efficiency and economically safety is very much essential for the people working in the plant as well as the nearby uh, area of the plant and then economically economically also it is very essential to make sure that plant operates uh, profit uh, under profitable condition that also be to be taken care by the chemical engineers and then check whether the product meets the requirements of the consumer or not that's also need to be checked by the chemical engineers then now we see a few common chemical industries some of the chemical industries like manufacturing of inorganic and organic chemicals like uh, sodium hydroxide sulfuric acid methyl alcohol polyethylene polyvinyl chloride etc then petroleum refining industry like conversion of crude into products such as kerosene gasoline benzene toluene etc then polymerization industries like uh, production of polyvinyl chloride high density polyethylene low density polyethylene polymethyl methacrylate etc these kind of polymers then ore beneficiation like where processing of iron ores etc are taking place then pharmaceutical industries food industries textile industries and so on so there are a number of chemical industries are there the purpose of listing these industries to have a kind of feel or realization that almost all industries the requirement of chemical engineers is there without uh, chemical engineers in, uh, involvement none of this industry may run efficiently okay now we see about the chemical plants chemical plants what we understand there is a reaction occurring obviously so that to get a product there may be by products there may be unreactant uh, unreacted reactants etc that's a different issue but raw materials that we get from the natural resources we may not directly using them as it is uh, for a reaction in the reactor okay there may be some kind of pre processing or purifying of raw material etc or size reduction of raw material etc required right so that means before the reaction there are a few steps that are to be taken care and then all those things to be taken care by the chemical engineers in chemical plant let us call them pre processing units okay and then reaction stage is the one stage right after the reaction again products are forming the products purification of the products has to be taken care right or you know separation of the unreacted uh, uh, you know reactants taking off the by products etc making the uh, product more purified than the uh, produce one etc may also required to be done after the reaction without any reaction right so that is known as the purification of the product stage or we can call them post processing stage like that the entire chemical plant we can make into three stages one stage is upstream processes stage which is also known as the pre processing of raw material stage then reaction stage where converting processed raw materials to products taking place and then downstream processes where post processing of products takes place so now how this upstream process or pre processing of raw materials takes place let us say you are generating power by coal combustion now coal you get in big big lumps you know big big lumps like some some coal rocks may be having diameter 5 to 10 meters or even bigger some may be having 1 meter some may be having few centimeters like that different size particles may be there now all of them may not be suitable directly to take uh, to take them into the uh, 
combustion reaction, right? Fluidized bed combustion. If you are doing in the fluidized bed, you cannot take such big particles. So then you have to reduce them in the size so that it is suitable to process in the combustion uh, or combusting combusting reaction wherever the combustion is taking place, whichever reactor you are taking. Usually, fluidized bed reactors are used for these cold combustions. Okay. So then accordingly you have to do size reduction. Then when you uh, take out this coal from the natural sources, these uh, coal are also having some impurities like mud, dirt, etc. all those things or maybe some other minerals may also be there naturally possible because this coal you are excavating from the uh, underneath of the earth you are taking them. right? So then you have to separate them otherwise they may be interfering the reaction. Right? So, for that you what you have to do? You have to crush them into the smaller size suitable to feed into the reactor and then before uh, feed, after crushing directly you cannot put them into the reactor, you have to wash them so that to remove the, the dirt, mud, etc. those things should also be removed. Right? So, washing may be required. Okay? Then after washing you know coal may become wet, so you cannot take the wet coal into the reactor otherwise you may not get your reaction may not be efficient. So again you have to dry the uh, crushed coal, crushed and washed coal. So these kind of steps are required. So all these things are you know uh, uh, known as the pre-processing uh, steps, upstream processes we call them in general as a uh, common terminology where we may have uh, crushing grinding, washing, filtration, drying, mixing, etc. And then what you understand by terminology of these processes or operations, you can see them, there are only physical changes. When you crush, is there any reaction taking place? No. When you wash, is there any reaction taking place? No. When you are drying, is there any reaction taking place? No. You are drying at such a temperature that reaction does not take place, combustion does not take place. Right? Filtration when you are doing, is there any reaction? No. So what I mean to mention that all these processes when they are uh, taking place either physical or mechanical changes are only occurring. No chemical changes are occurring. Okay? So these kind of operations where only physical or mechanical changes occurring, we call them unit operations. We call them unit operations from chemical engineering terminology point of view. Right? Now, uh, given a natural resource, you have uh, crushed it, size reduced it, purified it, dried it, everything washed and dried, ev washing, drying everything you have done. Then now you have a processed raw material. Processed raw material you are having after upstream, after completing the upstream processes. Right? Then this processed raw material you have to feed to the reactor, let us say fluidized bed reactor where coal combustion is taking place. Coal, I am taking an example so that to explain easily. Any uh, chemical plant, these are the things are common. Okay? So in the uh, fluidized bed combustion uh, reactor, combustion is taking place, right? then products are forming. So, in the reactor different types of reactions may take place, here I am taking combustion in general, so otherwise depending on the uh, chemical that you are producing there may be oxygenation reaction, there may be hydrogenation, polymerization reaction, dehydration reaction may be there, deoxygenation uh, reaction uh, may be there, hydro deoxygenation reaction may be there, nitration sulfation, different kind of reaction, uh, nitration sulfonation, uh, different kinds of uh, reactions are possible. So, these reactions, the equipment in which these reactions are taking place are also essential from the chemical point of view and these uh, reactions in general we call them unit processes. We call them unit processes and then these unit processes are n number of are there. All of them we cannot cover, we are going to see uh, about 25 to 30 unit processes which are common or commonly it is required to understand for a UG chemical engineering student. Right? Then let us say reaction has occurred, now product has formed, you have to purify the product either by separating the byproducts or taking out the uh, or recycling the uh, unreacted reactants etc. all those things you have to do. Even if those things are not there, you, you may be 
needing to purify them increase their percentage let us say in process you are producing a ethanol ethanol and water mixture has come as a product now you wanted to uh, uh, increase the ethanol percentage in the product ethanol is only there 70 percent you wanted to make the product purity as 95 percent pure then you have to do certain other processes we call them downstream processes or post processing uh, of the products where we may do something like distillation right it depends on the process to process evaporation may be there extraction may be there settling granulation centrifugation and so and so different types of uh, operations are there and then these operations are also there are only physical there are only physical and are mechanical changes only there is no reaction involved there may be temperature gradient involved in order to the process to take place but there is no reaction okay there may be pressure involved in order to uh, take uh, in order to uh, purify the product or whatever is the post processing is required but there is no reaction A reaction is there only in the unit processes So these operations such as distillation, evaporation, etc., they are also physical or mechanical processes only. There are no chemical changes. So these are also known as the unit operations. Now, what you understand? Chemical plant is a combination of several unit operations and unit processes that you can understand. But what you understand? There may be fewer reactions are there, right? So there may be one or two. Uh, reactors required in order to in order to make sure the uh, required reaction taking place but before that reaction and after that reaction you can see so many unit operations are there so many unit operations are there what i mean to say that the number of unit operations are more in any given plant compared to the unit processes and thus their design construction is going to make huge impact on the overall performance of the chemical plant fine okay so the successful commercial production is strongly dependent on selection design and operation of unit operations and then unit processes of any chemical industries right more than 60 to 70 percent of capital investment is on unit operations basically and then connections pipe connections etc okay in any of the chemical plant if you take so uh, not only unit processes unit operations selection design and operation of uh, unit operations is also very essential from the uh, operating of the chemical plant uh, viewpoint successfully successfully in the sense operating them safely efficiently and economically all three are important okay so now in this week we are going to see a few more details about the unit operations and unit processes in coming uh, slides as well as the coming lectures couple of lectures but before going to the next slide what i would like to mention that let us say distillation itself is a huge topic and then when you uh, do the mass transfer courses etc you can see that huge topic is converted into one or two chapters or something like that likewise individual unit operations if you see they are a wider topic we cannot uh, we cannot go into details of each and every aspect of the these unit operations or unit processes their size operation uh, working principles deriving equations and, and all that we are not going to see we are going to see only basics what is going to happen in a given unit operation what is a given unit process that is what we are going to see basics because detailed unit operations you may have other courses like mechanical unit operations one course is there in there you see the details of uh, mechanical unit operations then in mass transfer you see several types of uh, unit operations being discussed then heat transfer course also several types of uh, uh, unit operations being discussed and then uh, chemical reaction engineering kind of courses you see variety of uh, uh, unit processes 
So, individual courses are there to discuss about uh, uh, in detail about unit operations and unit processes. Thus, we are going to see only a few basics, what are they kind of thing, what for, what for they used, only that much only we are going to see in this particular course, okay? because this course is on production of inorganic chemical technology, this course is not on unit operations or unit processes. Okay? However, this is the fourth or fifth semester course in majority of the universities. So, then it is very much essential to know what are these unit operations and unit processes right now in this course itself. Okay? Now, we see a few uh, basics about unit processes. Chemical reactions occurring in many types of chemical industries are named as uh, unit processes. Example, nitration reaction, sulfonation reaction, oxidation reaction, chlorination reaction. I have given reaction associated with uh, inorganic chemicals production only. There may be other reactions associated with inorganic chemical production. Of course, we are going to see them as well in detail in the next slide onwards. Then chemical engineers can apply previous chemical reaction performance knowledge to new type of chemical produced from one or more unit processes. Let us say nitration is there, right? So, the nitration reactions are almost exothermic always and then physical chemical principles of equilibrium and then reaction rates are similar in general. So, whatever the uh, principles of equilibrium and reaction rate information etc. are there for these nitration reactions, they may be taken into consideration for designing or you know development of other uh, uh, products wherever these nitration kind of reactions are also included. Okay? So, that is example nitration reactions are almost exothermic and thus all, all of the physical and chemical principles of equilibrium and reaction rates of such nitration reactions are similar. So, then that information can be used wherever it is required by the chemical engineers. They need not to do those processes, those uh, development of equilibrium and then reaction rates etc. not necessary each and every time. And then selection of construction materials and equipment for unit processes can also be categorized. It is also very important because some reaction you may be doing in batch reactors, some reactions you may be doing in batch reactors, some reactions you may be doing in continuous reactors or you know combination of batch and continuous reactors those kind of things. You are going to see the different types of uh, batch and continuous reactors in chemical reaction engineering course anyway. So, depending on the nature of the reaction, the construction material for the equipment where this reaction is taking place is also very essential because some reactions may be taking place at ambient conditions just by mixing. Some reactions may be taking place at slightly higher temperature and slightly higher pressure, but some reaction may be taking place only at very high temperatures and high pressures. So, the material of construction of the equipment cannot be same under all conditions, right? So, if a uh, reaction is taking place at lower temperature, atmospheric temperature and pressure, then why do you waste the money in using a uh, construction material for the reactor which is sus uh, sustainable for high temperature and pressure because the material that is sustainable at high temperature and pressure obviously that will be going to be expensive. So, that is th that, that is the reason uh, you know you have to be careful while selection of the material of construction for the uh, for a given unit process. right? So, for example, liquid phase nitration carried out in well agitated reactor, it is a batch kind of reactor with a provision for heat removal and then material of construction for nitration is cast iron is sufficient, right? But the uh, reaction is occurring at high temperature and pressure then the material of construction for that or such kind of reaction if you are using cast iron that may not be good enough, okay? Now quickly we see common unit processes in chemical industries. Let us start with alkylation. Alkylation is addition of alkyl radicals that is CH3 with side chain final product. So, that let us say if you have one butylene and then if you do alkylation reaction with isobutane, then you can get isooctane like this in the presence of heat and uh, catalyst. Okay? These are the uh, representative reactions kind of thing. We are not giving exact 
uh, temperature, pressure or exact type of catalyst. As I mentioned, we are going to see a few basics. These are the very common unit processes that are occurring in chemical industries. There may be n number of uh, unit processes or reactions occurring uh, are available in the chemical engineering discipline, but we are not going to see all of them. We are going to discuss a few of them as a kind of uh, uh, basic knowledge. Where we have such kind of uh, alkylation reactions in general in petroleum and, uh, uh, petroleum and other types of organic chemicals production plants, you see such kind of alkylation reaction. Then amination by ammonolysis, right? Amination is nothing but you are adding amine group, NH2 group to a organic component, right? So, that reaction is taking place. How it is taking place? By adding ammonia. It can be done different ways also. Those things are also we are going to see. Let us say you have ethylene dichloride and then if you react it with ammonia, then you can get ethylene diamine. This NH2, if you get, it is becoming amine. Similarly, adipic acid, if you react with ammonia, then you get adiponitrile. Where do we get uh, such kind, where do we find such kind of chemicals in uh, applications in dye stuffs, many uh, organic chemical synthesis and then synthetic fibers, we usually use adiponitriles. Then amination by reduction. Again the amination reaction only, but by reduction, how if you do some kind of reductions, then you can produce amines. How? One example you have, let us say 2 nitro paraffin if you are having, you react with the hydrogen, then you get isopropyl amine. Applications, dye stuffs, organic chemicals, then ammonoxidation. oxidation. Here what you have? organic component is being reacted with ammonia and then oxygen. That is the reason these reactions are known as the ammonia oxidation, okay? where let us say example propylene if you react with ammonia and air then you will get acrylonitrile, acrylonitrile as a product. This acrylonitrile is often used in plastics and fiber, synthetic fibers industries. Then calcination, very uh, well known reaction for almost all uh, chemical engineering students where limestone if you heat you get lime and carbon dioxide. Applications is cement industry, then carbonylation here we react with the uh, carbon monoxide. So, that is the reason this reaction is called as carbonylation. Let us say methanol plus carbon monoxide if you react then you get acetic acid. Acetic is a, uh, acetic acid is very much used in many of the organic chemical synthesis and in process applications. Then carboxylation, so here what we do? We react with carbon dioxide to get certain products. So, for example, if you have sodium phenoxide and then react with the carbon dioxide, then you get sodium benzoate. Right? This sodium benzoate is often used as a antimicrobial food preservative uh, pre it prevents or uh, slow down the growth of bacteria, drug allergen kind of thing or the applications of this sodium benzoate. Then combustion. Combustion is a common terminology for the reactions like let us say combustion that means you know you are reacting a component in the presence of oxygen, right? applying some energy, heat then to get some products that is a common way. right? Uh, there, are, there may be a number of uh, uh, combustion reactions may be there. For example, methane combustion if you do using oxygen, then you get carbon dioxide and water and then this reaction is very much common in process heating applications, in process heating applications. Then condensation, let us say if you have benzaldehyde and then acetaldehyde, if you react them together in the presence of sodium hydroxide, then you get cinnamaldehyde and water. Application, this cinnamaldehyde used as a flavoring agent in chewing gum, ice cream, candies, etc. Then thalic anhydride and benzene, if you react together, you get anthroquinone. Applications are dye stuffs, which is also used as a bird repellent on seeds, gas generator in satellite balloons, etc. Then cracking or pyrolysis. Cracking or pyrolysis is nothing but in the presence of or in inert atmosphere, 
you apply the energy to a bigger size molecule so that to get smaller size molecules, organic molecules, etc. That is what happens in the pyrolysis or cracking. For example, representative reaction, a molecule with the 7 carbon atoms are there, if you do the pyrolysis then it is possible that you can get uh, two components like this, right? Such kind of pyrolysis or cracking reactions are very common in petroleum, coal industries and then biomass, bioenergy, etc. Cyanidation or cyanation reaction, let us say acetylene if you react with hydrogen cyanide then you can then you can get acrylonitrile. It is acrylonitrile is very much used in plastics industries, synthetic rubber, acrylic fibers, etc. Cyclization reaction. In general, linear molecules, organic molecules, or whatever are there. If you remove hydrogen by some provisions, then there is a possibility of cycling cyclic molecules formation possibilities are there. So let us say. This component, if you remove hydrogen by some means, then it is possible that you can get cyclohexane. From N hexane, you are getting cyclohexane. This cyclohexane is uh, very common in petroleum industries. It is also a raw material for production of adipic acid, caprolactam, which are precursors for nylon manufacture, etc. Then dehydration reaction. Dehydration, hydration means that dehydration means removing the water molecules. Let us say uh, ethyl alcohol, if you do the dehydration, then you can get ethylene and water. Similarly, calcium hydroxide, if you do the dehydration, then you can get calcium oxide and water. Applications are possible in many organic chemicals and inorganic chemicals productions. Then dehydrogenation, that is removing the hydrogen, so that is the reason it is a dehydrogenation reaction. For example, you have one butane, if you do the dehydrogenation by removing the hydrogen, you can get 1,3-butadiene and then hydrogen as products and this 1,3-butadiene is a colorless gas which can be easily condensed used for manufacturing of synthetic rubbers. Then diazotization and coupling reactions, let us say you have an amine and then reacting with HCl and HNO2, then you can get R into Cl and then water molecule, right? So, this amine is nothing but let us say aniline. This amine we can call it am aniline if this R is benzene, right? If it is C6H5NH2 then that's a, that is called as aniline. It is producing benzene diazonium chloride. This is nothing but benzene diazonium chloride and then it is very unstable products, so that is the reason it is prepared on demand and then supplied, it cannot be stored for long time. Then another type of uh, reaction here, we have dimethylamino azobenzene are produced if R is benzene here, right? Applications are there, dye stuffs, dimethyl orange, etc. And then disproportionation reactions, right? Let us say two molecules of propylene if you react then it is possible that you can get ethylene and then butylene, okay? Applications are organic chemicals and double decomposition or metathesis reactions. Let us say calcium hydroxide, if you react with sulfuric acid, then calcium sulfate you get. In organic chemicals industries often we see such kind of reactions. Then esterification reaction, let us say you have uh, alcohol and then carboxylic acid, if you react together then you can get ester. Similarly, alcohol if you react with the sulfuric acid then also you can get uh, sulfate product like this. So these esters etc. are often used in oils and fats, soaps and detergents industries etc. Reacting an halogen with organic component is halogenation kind of reaction, okay? So for example, you have ethylene and then chlorine reacting together, you get ethyl, ethylene dichloride. Similarly, you have toluene and then you react with the chlorine, you get benzyl chloride. Applications are, you know, many in organic chemicals. Benzyl chloride is a precursor for uh, benzyl esters, which are used as plasticizer, flavorant, perfumes, etc. 
It is also used as a precursor for uh, many pharmaceuticals and many other chemicals. Then hydration, dehydration means removing the water molecules, hydration in the sense adding the water molecules, right? Let us say you have uh, ethylene adding water and then reacting them, you try to get ethyl alcohol. We are not specifying the reaction temperature, pressure, catalyst, etc. that is not required. Similarly, calcium oxide if you react with water then you can get calcium hydroxide. Applications are uh, available in organic and inorganic chemicals production. And then hydroformylation reaction, let us say olefin being uh, reacted to get aldehyde let us say, like in this family in this fashion by addition of C. Let us say R, CH2, CH2, CO and then H2 are being added so that this aldehyde component CHO functional group if we are having then we are that means that is a that component is a aldehyde component and then aldehydes are often common in many of the organic chemicals. Hydrogenation that means adding of the hydrogen, dehydrogenation is removing the hydrogen, hydrogenation is adding the hydrogen to a component let us say R double bond double prime R if you are reacting with H2 then you can get RH. H R prime applications like fats, waxes, coal, hydrogenation, petroleum, etc. Similarly, hydrolysis is one type of reaction where uh, example is you know chlorobenzene is reacting with water to get the phenol. Then hydroxylation is another type of reaction where let us say one alcohol is reacting with the ethylene oxide, then you are producing a uh, bigger alcoholic component like this. So, these are you can find in detergent manufacturing industries as application. Then isomerization reactions, let us say you have a uh, linear 4 component uh, N-butane is there. So, then you apply heat in presence of catalyst then you can get a isopropane you may get application in petroleum industries. Similarly, nitration reaction let us say you have a benzene ring react with the nitric acid then you get uh, nitrobenzene. Okay. Similarly, you have uh, other uh, uh, linear. Uh, similarly, you have other linear uh, organic. Let us say here, here we are having n-propane reacting with the nitric acid. Then we get nitroparaffins like this. Different are possible depending on the conditions, etc. Applications are explosives, dye stuffs, organic chemicals. Then oligomerization. Let us say you have 1,3-butadiene, if you do oligomerization you can get a component like this 1,3,5-cyclododecatriene. Applications are there in many organic chemical industries. In oxidation, let us say one alcohol if you do the oxidation then you can get a aldehyde and then carboxylic acid like here I have shown, some more are shown here. Addition polymerization, let us say ethylene monomer you are having, you add them together, then ethylene dimer you may get. Like that, if you keep on adding, then you can get polyethylene. Similarly, polyvinyl monomer you are having CH2 double bond CHX. If you keep adding like this, then you can get uh, you know dimers like this, and then keep adding like this, then it is possible that you get polyvinyl polymer. Okay. So here X is for the chlorides or acetate. If it is uh, Cl then it is polyvinyl chloride, if it is acetate then polyvinyl acetate. Petroleum, plastics, elastomers, synthetic fibers are some kind of applications where we use them. Then condensation, polymerization, it is nothing but splitting off of small molecules such as H2O, NH3, CH2O, NaCl, etc. For example, you have ethylene glycol and tartalic acid if you react them together then you can get alkyd resins and then water. So these are very common in petroleum plastics industries, synthetic fibers productions etc. Then reduction reactions, one example of a reduction reaction is uh, given here 3 TaCl4 plus Al is giving 3 TaCl3 plus AlCl3 which is a reduction reaction. Polymer catalyst manufacture because these are often used as a catalyst in polymeric industries. Sulfonation reaction, if you react benzene with sulfuric acid then you get benzene sulfonic acid as a product which is 
used as surfix active agent, dye stuffs, etc. is also used as active laundry ingredients in detergents, etc. It is also used uh, as a stripping agent for removing of polymers in polymeric industries. And then finally, one more reaction. Now, with this reaction, we are going to wind up the unit processes, thionation reaction. Let us say if you have a, uh, this component and then reacting with the sulfur, then you can get thiopine as a component. Similarly, let us say if you have a methanol, you react with the H2S, then you get methane thionyl as a product plus water you can get. Okay? Now, these are like this thiopine in general used as building blocks in many agrochemicals and pharmaceuticals industries. Methane thiol is also known as methyl mercaptan and used to produce methionine which is used as a dietary component in poultry and animal feed. It is also used in plastic industry and as a precursor in manufacture of pesticides. Used in natural gas industry as added odorant due to its ideal compatibility with the methane. It is also having the characteristics of rotenex and then this smell is often used as an indication of a possible gas leakage in production of these chemicals in general. So, we have seen a few examples of unit processes. In the next class, we are going to discuss basics about a few unit operations as well. The references for today's lecture are provided here. So, most of the lecture details you can find out from this book. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.